This is Humanianity Conversation number 88, recorded on December 12, 2020. It is the 45th recorded conversation with my friend Mike. We continued our discussion of the differences in our worldviews, especially with regard to what we considered to be axioms, i.e. assumptions, and to what extent such axioms are necessary and appropriate. We have significant differences regarding our beliefs about the nature of existence that is related to these issues. We also discussed some issues related to supernatural beliefs and the role of science within our belief systems. Uh, just to refresh everybody who might be listening, uh, you know, we, we, I recall we, uh, we didn't record the entire session last time, and I was going to try to remember what we talked about so we could re refresh some of it. And not unexpectedly, I can't remember <laughs> exactly what we talked about at all. But um, what I do remember is that we had ended, you had made a request that, that you wanted to explore and talk this session a little bit more on this whole question of, does my wife exist when I'm not thinking about her? And how did I arrive at the changes in my thinking with regards to that. That was, I recall, the last thing that we ended with, that we anticipated on talking about today. Um, do you want to continue talking about that or? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, so I, um, <clears throat> the, um, my thinking on that, because you request some clarity on that, my thinking on that, like I described, had, had changed. Um, quite, quite, I don't know about quite a bit, but it had changed. So you had asked me that question uh, several months ago, and I thought about it for a minute, and I, I, I said, you know, I'm not sure, and then I said, probably not, meaning my wife probably doesn't exist, what I'm not thinking about her. Now, here was how I kind of arrived at that answer. Um, I try to imagine what it would be like for me to not think about my wife and then imagine and then kind of consider whether or not she exists, whether or not I thought she exists. And it kind of occurred to me very, very quickly that the the uh, if i am really not thinking about my wife really really not thinking about her i have no awareness of her in any way um you know what so the, the answer that you know what would that be like and th the answer the, the the state that i that i would consider myself of being the, um, in terms of whether or not my wife existed for me. I was kind of trying to think to myself. Well, Go ahead. <clears throat> you said exist for me. And that is a significant <clears throat> difference than just exist. Well, that's where I'm going with this. Yeah, that, that, that's the core thing here. Okay. Um, I, you we have we have well anyway let me continue this and then we can we can go talk about this idea of exist um so i had tried to, i had tried to at, at per your request tried to answer the question so I, I was thinking to myself if i am if i am i am imagining myself in a state where i'm not thinking about my wife i have no awareness of her and i'm asked myself 
in that state, can I say that my wife, when I'm in that state, can I say that my wife exists or does not exist? And I felt that in that state, I was closest, I was closer to her not existing than she does exist. So it was kind of a judgment call. But as I thought about that more, I, came, I really had shifted my thinking on that. And I had said to myself, well, look, if I'm not, if I'm really not thinking about my wife and I have no awareness of her at all, then whether or not she exists in that moment is completely unknown to me. I have absolutely no idea whether she exists or not. So that's why I had changed my thinking on that from she probably doesn't exist to I have no idea whether she exists or not. That's how, the, that's the kind of the ideology of that whole thinking and, and how I changed. Is that kind of clear? I know you may not agree, but do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, I think that I do. Um, the uh, the phenomenon that we're taught that you are talking about is um, um, what's going on. This will not be. Uh, uh, real accurate usage of words, let's say, but what's going on in your mind at any particular time. And um, uh, there, there, are, there, are two, there are two issues. Uh, well, basically, uh, whether you are thinking about something or not, and whether that something exists or not. And um, uh, so when you were talking about um, whether it existed for you, exist for you, you were talking about what was going through your mind, but that's different than um, if you never even existed, uh, would um, these other things exist like people uh, other people and uh, uh, all the different things in the universe, et cetera, that we believe exists. See, my thinking on that as a result of me trying to kind of answer your question that you posed during our last discussion, my thinking is actually involved even further on this. And I, I kind of, when I was really thinking about answering this question, I really wonder if what you're asking me is really what you're intending to ask me. And let me clarify. I wonder if what you're asking me is, because this, is this is an easier question for me to answer. Um, when you imagine yourself not thinking about your wife, does your wife exist? Okay, that's an easier question for me to answer. Then the, then the answer is yes, she does exist. But when you ask me, does your wife exist when you are not thinking about her? That's a very, very different question. So I think, again, I think what you're asking me, another way of putting it is. Can you repeat if, that? Yes, yeah, let me say it another way. If you imagine yourself not thinking about. No, can you uh, say it the same way again? Um, when you imagine yourself not thinking about your wife, does she exist? And I would say, yes, she does, with clearly. But when you ask me, does your wife exist when you're not thinking about her? That's a very different question. I think what you really are intending me to do is answer the question that I first posed, that I first kind of reformulated, which was when you think, when you imagine yourself not thinking about your wife, does she exist? I think that's really what you're asking. No, no, that doesn't sound right. I wasn't asking. Um, it, it has to do with um, whether things exist or not, even though you are not thinking about them. I think it's even more than that. 
um, well, I, I, th I, you know, I think that you, there is, um, I, in my opinion, you are confusing an imaginary state with something that can really happen. I don't think uh, maybe as a function of language or, or whatever it might be, but you cannot not think you, you, you something can you, you can you cannot imagine or consider a state when you're not thinking about something. It's not possible that that state of existence can never happen and has we've been through this before can never happen and has never happened in the history of humanity. You, you cannot not think about something. You cannot consider something's existence when you're not thinking about it. It's a complete well, imaginary yeah, state. You know, that's, uh, you cannot consider, uh, it, it, it's, um, my, my last statement um, uh, is, is what I'm trying to, have us focus on, and that is whether um, there are things that exist, even though you uh, are not thinking about them and have no awareness of them. Okay, well then let's go through that. <clears throat> uh, give me an example of something that exists that you're not thinking about right now. Well, uh, that's a separate issue. I understand that. Okay. That when you're asking me, uh, well, what's an example of something you're not thinking about? <laughs> well, then if I give an example, I'm thinking about it. I understand that. How is that a separate issue then? Then maybe I don't understand. Okay, so we're getting back <clears throat> in uh, to, okay. That doesn't um, seem like a separate issue. There is um, uh, the question is whether anything exists that you are not thinking about or perceiving. Okay. How is that a separate issue? Well, how maybe I don't understand what you mean by separate issue. How is that unrelated to my claim that you cannot consider something you're not thinking about? Well, that seems very they, they importantly are, related. They, they are, uh, in my mind, two completely separate, um, separate questions or considerations. Please explain why. Um, I have not seen the inside of your house. Um, I just thought up this example right now. Uh, so prior to my thinking up that example, um, I was not thinking about or perceiving the inside of your house, yet I would consider that the inside of your house was existing uh, throughout all of that time that I was not thinking about it. Oh, but when you were, that's not what you're asking me. See, you're asking me to apply it to this scenario you just described. <clears throat> would be equivalent of me asking you, um, when you were not thinking about or considering the inside of my house, did the inside of my house exist for you in that moment? That's, the, that's what you're asking. You're asking from my point of view. You're asking me to answer for myself. Doug, do I think my wife exists. So you're doing the same thing. You're asking yourself from, you're asking from your point of view when from, I'm asking, you're asking, I'm asking you, did, does the inside of my house exist, exist for you 
when you weren't thinking about or considering it right before you said it? Exist for you. That, but that's what you're asking me. You're not, you're, no. you're, you're playing with words here. No. Yes, no. you are asking me that. And no. you're asking yourself that. No, that's a, uh, essentially, that's a change in the meaning of the, the word exist. Uh, exist has a normal you usual meaning but when you say exist for you or exist for me that implies that something could exist for you and not for me okay for me and not for you and then that's that's a different meaning of the word exist okay so then that then okay so if that's the case then it, it seems like what you're saying is you can um, you can prove that the inside of my house exists, right? No. Well, you how? Wait a minute. Then, then now it seems like you're saying two different things. Your your what does exist mean? Maybe you should. What does exist mean? Yeah, and that uh, I I see that as a formidable. Um, a, a form, formidable uh, task is uh, defining the word exist. Well, I think we could we could we could um, make some progress if we just uh, narrow it to this to this conversation. Because um, I think that the word exist means different things. Um, uh, like, for instance. Um, whether um, uh, whether one's car exists or whether democracy exists no, I think it's or necessary. whether contradiction exists. The word exist is used in all three of those sentences, but it, the word exist would have different meanings. I don't think it has, I don't think that uh, lack of clarity in the word applies to this situation. You, I think that you are by, in the way you're using the word exist in the scenario as regards to the inside of my house, okay? You, you, you are claiming that the inside of my house um, exists in the same sense that a car exists. That's the way you're using the word existence. It's not like democracy or, or, or some kind of, it's, you're, you're talking about kind of physical object existing like a car. Okay. So we, we, can, we, can, we can kind of take just that. So and I'm gonna ask you, oh, go ahead. Okay, but what I'm saying is that, um, that you change the meaning of the word. I don't think I did. Uh, you don't know what I was going to say. I think I do, but go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, that uh, uh, your the meaning of the word exists as you're using it changes from when you're talking about that which exists and that which exists for me or for you. No, I'm not changing the word. I thinking that I, I believe that you're not being you're not in my opinion respectfully. I don't think you're fully in I don't think you're I think you uh I think that you are taking for granted certain things in your belief system as simply just axiomatic. And without recognizing that um, uh, you're doing that. that so I, I, I don't think that, so I think if you really pull apart what you're asking me, what you're really asking me and what, you, what you're asking yourself is, is, does the inside of my room exist for me? But I know that you, you're, you're taking for granted the meaning of exist to mean something. So that, that's why I want to take you through this kind of exercise to show you that I think that's what you mean. So, no, okay. no. so if, if the inside of my house. What you stated was not what I meant. Well, let's, 
then let me get some clarity on that. So um, there's a claim that the inside of my house exists for every, for not just you, for everybody when you are not thinking or considering its existence. Okay, but see, when you say exist for, that's a different meaning of the word exist than, than the normal meaning. I just said exist for everyone. I think it's an it's a additional mm -hmm. clarity. Well, then what does exist? Can we agree that when you use the word existence, you mean exists for everybody? No. What do you mean? No, the, uh, the, the for, uh, saying exist for fill in the blank, is it uh, implies a different meaning than just the word exist. What does the word exist imply? Well, that's what I'm saying that uh, it is very difficult uh, to um, to be precise about that. And I think you are correct uh, that uh, it's because uh, there is an axiomatic or assumed um, uh, belief, I guess, um, in the use of the word exist. Um, See, with, with is this different exist for so and so is a different okay. meaning of the word. Let me change that. How about I? How about exist universally? Is that Fair? More accurate, do you think, given your definition of existence? Uh, my worry about that would be what the word universally meant. Um, See, I think that this is, I think one of the reasons why you're having a difficult time nailing the exact definition of existence has to do with the difficulty in recognizing the axiomatic nature of it. It's axiomatic and you don't want to admit it's axiomatic, but it really I is being said, used that way, I think. I, I just said a moment ago that that's uh, what I uh, believe that, that, that um, uh, there was an axiomatic aspect uh, oh, oh, so not that the axiomatic, there, that was an admission, there was an axiomatic aspect to it. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that we are in agreement yet, uh, but what I'm saying is to, uh, to precisely define the word exist, um, is um, is going to be very difficult, and that the use of the word exists does have within it um, the an axiomatic belief uh, of, of some sort. And but that this is unclear currently. Maybe we can look at it a different way. Okay. So you claim that the inside of my house exists when you're not thinking or considering it. Can you provide an argument that will convince someone else of the same thing? So uh, where I'm... Where I'm going with this is if there is existence of the inside of my house in the way that you are claiming, I believe you should be able to do that. Now, I should be able to do what? You should be able to present an argument to convince somebody irrefutably, almost prove that the inside of my house does indeed exist when you're not thinking you're considering it. Well, even without putting on the end, uh, even when you're not considering it and so forth, uh, 
It uh, no, I don't think one could prove that. Um, or I, maybe prove is a wrong. Prevent a, present a, a very very convincing argument. Well, it would have to do with. Um, like telling this person about my friend Mike and how I had visited him in his home or something like that. And, uh, uh, but as far as, uh, as far as this person was concerned, I could be making it up or I could not be making it up, but it'd still be incorrect. Okay. That way I was delusional or had a false memory or something like that. Okay. So then since we're not talking about this additional complication of the inside of my house existing when you're not thinking you're considering it, let's just go with this then. Um, so you, what is then the criteria to convince, what is then the criteria for someone to claim that something exists in the case of this other person you're trying to convince. What, what did he use to say, I agree with you, the inside of Mike's house does indeed exist? Well, see, I think that that is a, a different issue. The question about um, whether things exist that you're unaware of and may never even be aware of and whether a particular thing exists are two entirely separate uh, questions. Well, I think what I'm trying to highlight here uh -huh. is, and we talked about this, I think I recall in the last session, this, this, the preferential nature of believing in certain criteria that constitutes existence. Uh, well, I didn't understand that. You have a certain preference for what constitutes something existing. And I believe that you are claiming that your preference has accuracy independently of what you prefer. And when I am giving you this example of this other person, I'm trying to highlight this idea that the criteria for something to exist is simply a preference. And it's not possible to show in any way the existence of something without relying axiomatically, and here's what's axiomatic about it. What, what you're taking as axiomatic is your preference for what constitutes the criteria for something to be claimed actually exists. Uh, I could not follow that. <laughs> um, uh, it was sort of complex, but the, the, um, the issue Again, there are, there are two separate issues. There's the question that is more the one that we have been debating, and that is whether uh, anything exists that you are not, uh, have not been aware of, are not aware of and, and have not- in, the, in that moment. No, not in that moment. Well, it's a given. If you if you have never experienced or are never aware of something, you in any single moment you can. I guess I'm going a step beyond what you're saying. I'm saying even if you've experienced something and know about something in the past, if you're not currently thinking of it or aware of it, then it doesn't exist. Well, I, that that's that's my old way of thinking. I then let me let me let me say. Yeah. It's impossible to know whether it exists or not. Let me just put it to you that way. That's a more accurate statement. You can't, you, it's unknown whether it exists. Well, there, now we bring in the word no, K-N-O-W. Uh, well, I, well, I clarify that. It, 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 
it's you cannot claim that it exists or doesn't exist. You just don't know. Well, that user, you 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 can't. Well, I could just say that you can't claim it doesn't. The most the most accurate statement there is to not claim it exists or not claim it doesn't exist. You are unaware. See, there's a third possibility. You're aware it exists, you're aware it doesn't exist, or you are unaware of both possibilities. That's the third one. I claim the third one is the only reasonable one. Possibilities. Um, that, uh, that did not sound right. Um, because that would be a separate issue uh, as to what the possibilities are and so forth. Um, again, what I'm going back to is just whether um, it is appropriate to believe that there are all sorts of things that exist that we have no awareness of and have never given any thought to and have not perceived. You are in order, uh, here again, in order, you, you are thinking about it and you, you, you are, let me see if I can, let me sort of make this clear by making it some, thinking maybe an analogy would make it clearer. Um, nah, I can't do it, I can't think of an analogy, but I'll just all just say it out right. When you claim to, you know, to, to, to say that um, th that uh, you know things don't exist that we're not aware of and are not thinking about is ludicrous, well, you are thinking about them and you are considering them. They're called, quote unquote, things you're not aware of and are not thinking about. Well, you see, are thinking about them. No, well, I'm That's not. The, I'm talk, you, you're just aren't being specific. I'm talking about right. I'm not. I'm talking about the specific things that there are specific things that exist that you will never have any uh, awareness of. Now, just my putting that into words uh, doesn't is not the equivalent of. Uh, experiencing them. So we are talking about, uh, we are talking about that which um, that which is not so or that which is impossible. I think we're, we're, we're talking about um, not just whether we are thinking about something um but about the nature of quote reality or the nature of uh <clears throat> the world so now i think you're saying something a little bit different so now you're bringing out you just said you know we can't experience it yeah that, that wasn't the question the question wasn't does your wife or does the inside of your house exist when you're not experiencing it it was does the inside of your house exist when you are not thinking about it or not considering it at all? That's different. So I, I, I think and there's a different answer. So say that again, I didn't. Uh... Well, in what you just said, you've brought up this idea. You, you, you said, you, you used the word experience. Can say it again. Can you say again what you just said? Oh. Um, well, let me just um, just say it point blank. The, the question posed to this point was whether the inside of my house exists when you are not, or when someone is not thinking about it or considering it. A new question I think was just introduced was this idea of, does something exist when you're not experiencing it? That's a that's a different question. You can think about something and be aware of something without experiencing it. It's your imagination, which is why I claimed before. I think what you're really asking me is, does my wife exist when you imagine yourself not thinking about her? No. 
That has absolutely, I, I mean, I, I think this is something um, that is so um, the, the clearly, word, cl clearly word, untrue, in my opinion. The word when uh, is uh, the problem there. So um, you're saying that uh, the question can either be does, or maybe I'm saying it, uh, the, the question can be does X exist or does, exi does X exist when you're not thinking about it? Um, I th I th we, we didn't go through this last time. I wish we had a recording of it. I don't think we did. Um, then I need, then I really need you to show me how such a state is possible. What state? A state of claiming something exists when you're not think claiming that X exists when you're not thinking about X. Yeah, I need you to I need you to somehow show that to me. I'm open to it. The state of my making a claim. No, I think I think uh, well, you could tr let's try that one. But I think what I'm asking you to do is to show in some kind of way that X can exist when you're not thinking about or considering X. Or let's try what you said, let, that's a harder question. Let's go with what you just said. Explain how that, how you can make that claim. What claim? How, that X exists. How can you, how can you make, how can you go about stating that when you are not thinking or considering X. That's a separate issue. It's not. How is that a separate issue? Show that to me. Well, that's what I, I think it was. Oh, I have my glasses. Ah, much better. <laughs> um. See, we, we focus in on something and then back off from it and focus in and then back off uh, by backing off, making other uh, statements or uh, and so on. But um, so I keep wanting to get back to the claim that I'm making. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, we could, let's do that. That's fine. Okay, my claim is that um, th there are all sorts of things that exist that I have no knowledge of, awareness of, perception of, and never will. But those things still exist. Uh, I would argue you do have awareness of those things that you are not aware of. No, that's you know. Uh, that's, Wait a minute. That's that's an awareness that there are things, but it's not aware an awareness of those things. Those are two different things. Awareness that there are uh, uh, these entities, and uh, awareness of the entities are two separate things. Awareness that there are such entities okay. is different than the awareness of the entities themselves. Well, if you're well, I, then I can ask you the same question. Only it's a derivative. If you are on, so you're claiming yes, you're aware of these entities' existence. You can talk about these entities that don't exist um, in the sense that See, you're now, aware. Uh, you said aware of their existence, aware that they don't exist. Yeah. 
you're 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 basically aware of the existence see that's we're saying that without the awareness of the existence there's still they those things still can exist yeah so i could show that that's that that claim is not true by looking at the at the implication the, the derivative of, of what you just of your claim okay so now we'll let's take it a step let's take it one step below let's take it one step what's to let's look examine the derivative of that claim so what I would think, what I would describe you're doing is that you are put, you are creating a set, and you're 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 putting inside of this set all the things that um, you are aware, you that you are unaware of, but yet exist. You're creating a set out of those things. Okay, so you're now aware of those things. You're creating a set of them. Uh huh. Okay. So your claim is that you can be aware of things. You can be aware of X. You, you can, uh, that X exists even though you're not aware of. So then we, I can ask you the same thing about what's in your set. You are unaware of specifically what's inside of your set. So X is what's one of those things inside of, your, inside of the set. And you are claiming that even though you don't know exactly what's inside of your set, you can claim that it exists even though you're unaware of it. So I'm gonna ask you, give me an example of something inside your set. What you're trying to demonstrate is that then I am awareness, uh, I am aware of it or something like that. But the set, is not the same as uh, an item within the set. No, it's not, but you're using, but you can use the same, what I believe to be problematic reasoning in the same way that you created the set. You could create a set within that set using the same reasoning, well, you should be able to. I, I'm not following. You created a set out of things that uh, you don't know exist, and you created a set out of it, right? Uh -huh. Okay. Inside of that set, there are things you don't know that exist. That's analogous to that first set you created. So you should be able to do the same thing. I should be able to ask you now, what's inside that set? Uh, and, and you should be able to use the same reasoning. I mean, what you're going to get down here is an infinite regress. And I could do the same thing to that set and to that set and to that set. This, this, so the sequence of reasoning is completely, I, th I claim, completely irrational. Yeah, and that just easily shows it. I don't follow what you're, um, what you're saying. Um, Maybe I could try, maybe the, the idea of derivative sets oh, is complicated me, here. Let me, let me try and- uh, Well, let, let me get in some words. Sorry, go ahead. Um, see, with our, our language, um, we can, um, we can define uh, a set um, in such a way that there can't be anything in it. That's one thing to be aware of. Um, uh, like for instance, the set of all propositions that are true and not true at the same time, that would be an example. Um, so uh, with our language, we can do all sorts of things um, that are peculiar just to the utilization of language. But getting back uh, to my fundamental assertion, um, and it really is, 
I would say axiomatic is that is that um, there are uh, all sorts of things that actually exist that I have no awareness of and never will. Okay, so let me maybe that idea with the set was a very, very complicated example that is would take a long time to, for us to get through. So let me let me just uh, try to highlight what I consider to be the problems with that line of thinking in a kind of easier way. Did, did you have a question? Well, I, I was hoping that you would huh. address what I had just said and it, I see now you were planning to. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to. Um, <clears throat> When you consider something axiomatic, you are basically saying it's a preference. It's an arbitrary decision based on a set of values and preferences you personally have that you are somehow elevating to the state of axiomatic, being axiomatic. Okay, just that right then and there, I think, highlights the what I could call the relativistic nature of existence. That claiming something exists is relative to a specific person because a different person can claim a different set of axioms. I don't uh, disagree that different individuals could have different, uh, different axioms, different world views and so forth. That appears to be true like uh, between you and me. Okay, so then if that's the case and axioms are necessarily, it appears, uh, necessarily characteristic of claiming something exists, then it would seem to be pretty, I claim obvious that exists, the, the claim of something existing is dependent upon what each individual has that they consider to be axiomatic in the definition of existence. Maybe make it clearer. Yeah, I, um, it got a little fuzzy. In, in my mind, um, I, I gather that your subjective experience, uh, your, uh, that, that, that for you, it seems very clear that you are right and that I am making mistakes and wrong and that, uh, uh, that you could hopefully change that and then I would, uh, uh, be um, uh, in agreement with you and so forth that 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 you have uh, uh, a fair amount of certainty about what you're saying, even the way that you're saying it. Mm. Uh, so that that's just an observation, I guess. Uh, well, I, I think your observation supports. The, that uh, the claim to a certain definition of existing and applying that then that definition to a situation regarding whether my wife exists or the inside of my house exists, the axiomatic nature of the definition of, of, of existence, that there's axioms, there has to be axioms within that definition, kind of it's very, very, very important. I claim in that, in that it, it makes it impossible for anyone to claim I'm right or the other person's wrong. And to put it more specifically, that my wife does indeed exist when I'm not thinking about her. Okay, it depends what set of axioms you use. Uh, what uh, axioms are you using? 
Well, I think it's an absence of axioms. Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, so, I think I said I think I haven't really considered. I haven't really considered what axioms that are yeah, using. Yeah, that, that's, so, so let me so let me consider let me consider the axiom. I think I think it, well, I should say it's very different axioms than the ones you're using. Um, yeah. What axioms am I using when I say my wife doesn't exist? Yeah. When I'm not thinking about her. Uh -huh. I'm using. Let me think. Try to make it analogous to the way you're using it. I am assuming. See like what axi How? Let me ask you. Can you help me with this? What axioms do you hear me making in that definition? I can't help you. Uh... Uh, uh, when I try to understand your line of thought, uh, uh, I run into confusion. Let me think about this very, very, uh, what? It's very difficult for me to understand, uh, me to identify what axioms I'm using. Mm -hmm. Um, what axioms am I using? I can understand that I, I'm going to try to do some kind of reflective technique. I'm going to try to examine what's axiomatic about your worldview and then try to understand based on analogy, maybe what I'm using is axiomatic. So, okay, so what's axiomatic Okay, so I think I got it. Um, I think what I'm using as, no, I don't know. No, that's this. Okay, so I, I just, the only thing I could think of is in your worldview, I claim that you are just considering a, it is, it is axiomatic that um, there is such a thing as, as something existing independent of your thinking about it. And the only thing I could think of is that I'm, I don't, I'm not making that, I am not accepting that as an axiom. I'm rejecting it and I'm saying that, that, that I'm not gonna use that as an axiom. But I'm trying to think if there's anything I'm replacing it with. Right. And I'm having a hard time doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I don't know what, what I'm using you know, as an axiom. I think, I think we're getting close to one of the main difficulties that we're uh, experiencing. Uh, I do uh, consider it to be axiomatic that things exist that I may never think about or, or perceive. Um, that uh, I'm, I accept that as an axiom. And um, uh, you are saying, well, that's not a good axiom, but you don't have one to replace it. Well, but that doesn't necessarily and, mean and you And you're, you're also saying wait, wait. that the Hold problem on. The, the, I need to, also, the, you're also saying I need to stop you at axiom. You're also saying that the the problem with your axiom is that it is an axiom. Right. So just um because you have an axiom doesn't mean it's appropriate to replace it with a different axiom. What could be appropriate is to simply not use an axiom. I, I certainly would say if the goal I would argue that if the goal is the pursuit of knowledge, then axioms are to a certain degree the antithesis of that because they encourage people to take things for granted, not question, no, I and don't, that's a problem. I don't agree with that. 
the problem is that um, you can't have um, belief, discussion, etc., without there being some axiom. Now, you can, I agree that you can always question an axiom. And so I'm wondering, well, what axiom do you go by? Well, there are certainly axioms that I have that I'll go through, but okay, then, then, well, then, I, then it's not an axiom. And then, well, then, is that an axiom then? If, is it an axiom? My understanding of an axiom, at least the way I'm using it, uh -huh. is something that is assumed is true. Yes. Okay, it's not questions, it's assumed it's true. Well, question you, and axiom, is that kind of a contradiction in terms? No, no, uh, um, it is like uh, that in order to function, one has to right. have an axiom, but uh, it is possible for that axiom to not be optimal and to be replaceable by a better one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I certainly can't show that, um, my wife doesn't exist when I'm not thinking about her. I can't show that, um, You know, that that nothing um, that you know that it, it's not, you know I, I'm not going to push myself in that way. I'm sorry, Bill. I don't hear I don't hear an axiom. I hear lack of axioms in my arguments, and I'm will I I would yeah. like to understand if I have one. Yeah, no, I, I don't feel I don't feel like I shouldn't make up stuff. I think maybe maybe a, maybe what I'm assuming is that there shouldn't be axioms. Maybe that's an axiom I'm going by. I, I have a value system maybe that that says to me, I should not, that axioms prevent me from, in my belief system, are, are the antithesis of, of, of attaining knowledge. Therefore, I'm gonna assume, I'm going to consider it axiomatic that all axioms should be rejected. Maybe something like that could be a fundamental basis, something I'm assuming to be true which may not be true. I can't well, show it. The problem is, and again, we've got that problematic word, no, K-N-O-W, only in the form of knowledge. Um, and then there are other words for it, like wisdom and, and so on, that, that are mostly the same, but maybe are not the, uh, precisely the same. But um, getting back to, this is interesting um, that um, the one of the basic differences between you and me is that I believe that um, in order to function, in order to live, one uh, has to have axioms even though uh, those axioms can be subjected to scrutiny to see if they are appropriate or not. Whereas you believe that one should not have axioms. No. Uh, I... Not make any assumptions, not assume anything. Oh, well, that's not, that's not true. And as a matter of fact, as you were saying, I, I, I agree with that. Axioms, what you just said, uh, axioms, are, are, are necessary and appropriate to understand, to apply in certain situations to help you understand that situation. In other situations and in other considerations, a different set of axioms should be used or perhaps no axioms. So I would agree with you the idea of axiomat of using axiomatic, of using axioms to help you understand situations. But the idea of using a single set of axioms as and claiming, you know, they should be used in all situations and apply all the time. I, that's what I don't agree with. For ex and I'm going to use this example. Perhaps it's analogous. Perhaps it's not. It's it's appropriate 
uh, to use Newtonian physics to go to the moon. It's in a, and use all the axioms there. It's inappropriate to use it when you're setting up a GPS to a certain degree. You have to use, you know, Einsteinian understanding of space and account for gravitational differences and how they distort space time, et cetera. The different set of axioms, different set of rules, different set of equations to understand two different situations. But see, now <clears throat> it's unclear. Um, it sounds like you are including in the category of axioms things that are not considered to be axioms, but are uh, considered to be uh, findings uh, that can indeed be questioned and are, like, for instance, uh, Newtonian uh, physics and so forth. Well, uh, the axioms have to do with something more fundamental upon which these other beliefs, upon which the various belief systems are, are built. Now, what I meant by that, and perhaps I'm complicating this by bringing this in, is um, uh, Einsteinian, uh, uh, Newtonian mechanics just basically describes um, the impact that gravity and inertia, inertia and all these things have on objects. It doesn't explain why. It's just kind of taken as an axiom that there's some force out there that we don't really understand that has these effects on objects. That's that, appropriate to go to the moon. That's, that's not an axiom. It's uh, it's the uh, uh, report of findings of- No, uh, what, what's axiomatic is that there's some force out there called gravity that has uh, these known impacts on objects. That's an axiom. I, uh, Newton, I don't Newton, think can't, Newton took for granted that there's a force called gravity out there. Couldn't explain it, had no one, he said for, he says, well, there's yeah. this thing that causes objects to attract, I'm gonna take it for granted. And I'm going to just observe how it works. That was an axiom. He was saying that that was an observation. I don't think he was saying it was an axiom. That well, was... He, it was an axiom. Yeah, well, no, he did make certain axioms about it. He, he applied universality to it, definitely. He assumed that, well, the, I don't know if, you know, the, the feather and the ball dropping here would apply to objects floating around the sun. He had no understanding. He kind of assumed that would be true. But it's that, that is that that's, assumption. It's not, yeah, but that's. Wait, 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 I don't want to get into mechanics, fine. If you, don't, if you don't consider that to be a valid assumption, that's why I, I postulate, I said, maybe I shouldn't bring this into it. So let's forget it. Can I speak? I don't, but I don't want to go down, we're wasting time. I don't want to talk about physics. I no, but I I'm talk. Still, you raise some issues. Oh, I wish okay. that go ahead. I could have see the number of words that you say is vastly more than mine. Of course, part of that is because of the speed of speech. Yeah. But, um, uh, but so uh, you say many many more things than I do. Uh, and um, uh, but again, uh, when Newton comes up with that there is a force called gravity that operates in a particular way, he did that on the basis of findings. Uh, and he, that would not be uh, considered an axiom. Uh, if we go back, uh, what what I, recognize as an axiom of mine is that there is a thing called reality or existence of which I am only one tiny part and uh, that it is possible for me to uh, understand and and uh, have beliefs about the existence of some of those things, but there are many that uh, that I will never uh, have any um, uh, awareness of or beliefs about that nevertheless do exist. It is an axiom in my mind that I am not alone uh, in 
a uh, bubble of uh, experience that um, is unrelated to anything outside that bubble. Okay, so some examples of Newtonian axioms. Uh, a body remains in a state of rest. I, I was reading this from, from uh, Google. Each body remains in a state of rest, a uniform rectilinear motion, as long as it's not forced upon by acting forces to change its state. It's, all bodies in motion tend to stay in motion. Does that call, does it call that an axiom? Uh, it's an axiom. Newton formulated his axioms essentially as follows. That's lex prima, lex quatra. Uh, there are 16 of them. Mm -hmm. So he used a set of axioms to create his laws of motion. Okay. Um, he did not understand why a body in a state of rest stays in a state of rest until acted upon by an outside force. Didn't know. It's just, he's, he just, that was an axiom. Those rules and those axioms can get us to the moon. Uh, when okay. you, when I you, think, I think that that is an incorrect. Uh, or different use of the word axiom than what what we have been meaning. Well, I uh, think it's the same in the sense that he is taking for granted. He is assuming something that he that he can't show, he can't prove. Uh, he's just going to assume it's true in order to create and understand a certain to explain us to explain things and he tried to explain the orbits of planets and how bodies move he used a set of assumptions for that they're called axioms and we're doing the same thing but what he's actually doing is creating a model uh, with which he can make predictions uh, that that model may be accurate or inaccurate well but he's creating a model Based when, on axioms. When we are talking about axioms, when we have been until just recent, uh, currently, um, we were talking about something different. Oh, I don't uh, think so. Let me explain uh, how. I'm sorry? Well, uh, I don't think so. We are creating, we are trying to explain a certain situation. And, and you know whether or not things exist. You know what we're trying to understand. Pick it to pick it uh, a nutshell. We're trying to understand what existence means. Okay, Newton was trying to understand the orbits of the planets. He made certain axioms. He accepted certain axioms in order to explain those orbits. We are making certain axiomatic statements to understand. The nature of existence. What okay? Uh, what he was doing was creating a model, saying, "Okay, the model has these characteristics to it, and that um, uh, that with this model he can predict what is going to happen." Uh, the axiom uh, that that uh, I understand that models can be. Uh, very accurate or very inaccurate, uh, and so forth, and uh, that they can be changed. Uh, so uh, I don't think that uh, I don't think Google was using um, the word axiom in the way that you and I had started using it. Although you have switched to using it in this new way. However, let me say that I may uh, be somewhat incorrect in that, in that uh, certainly uh, my um, axiom is a model. Exactly. That's what I was going. That's why I raised my hand. Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Please let me let me try to finish. Go ahead. Go ahead. I want to say I agree with you. Yeah, certainly. See, I get a little oh, disappointed when you know when when I 
I shouldn't have said anything. I was excited to agree with you. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, I tried to avoid doing that and let you finish what you're saying. Uh, unless there's something really uh, that I want to point out, like when you use the word exist or use that phrase, then I raised my finger and uh, said, you know, I want to call that to your attention at the time, not uh, several minutes later. But, um, okay, so, so I, uh, yes, it is a model that I have, um, according to my meaning of model, uh, that says that there is reality and then there, there are my various models of that reality that um, uh, that have varying degrees of accuracy. Uh, and so that that idea itself, uh, that that model saying that there is reality is uh, is indeed um, something that I am assuming, and um, uh, and I would say that it works. Number one, it works for me. Number two, I can't imagine uh, a different model working for me. And uh, so, for instance, uh, when I look at you attempting to describe your model of uh, solipsism, um, I think, uh, and I hear you say, uh, although you changed it subsequently, uh, when I'm not thinking about or perceiving my wife, she does not exist, meaning that she pops in and out of existence. Uh, that, that, that model could not work for me. Uh, I, I could not, um, uh, I, it, it would uh, produce a strange life. Now, uh, you have indicated that there is one benefit to that model. And that is that, um, uh, that um, therefore, um, there's what exists for you, which may not exist for me. There's re uh, there's your reality, there's my reality, and so on. And so, therefore, we don't have to get into a fight. <laughs> uh, the uh, postmodern solution to uh, our tendency, when having difference of opinion, to engage in, uh, in uh, uh, hostile behavior and so forth, for anger to arise because of disagreement and so on. But uh, I uh, think that that is something that can be accomplished without the, uh, the solipsistic uh, model. And I think that the um, uh, solipsistic model is not, um, not very functional. And I think that, uh, uh, that the idea that uh, if there is difference of opinion uh, that, uh, and it is in a significant area of opinion, namely that which has an effect on quality of life, that we should work toward agreement. Now, my uh, one, okay, I, one, one observation I wanna make here is okay. that, uh, is that um, I did not have the feeling that you were really trying to put yourself in my place and try to see things as I was trying to uh, lay out as they were for me, but instead that you were thinking your own thoughts and even typing on your computer. Uh, I have to type. 
because you 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 bring in you know eight different ideas and i i recognize i can't stop you because you get confused so i have to write them down i i unfortunately there are some times where i can remember but very often i'm i'm completely kind of yeah. not lost but i i just can't but uh i, let me, I understand there's a, a couple, yeah there's a couple of things so i, I just want to remind us point, it, it's all I'm saying is that when person A talks to person B, uh, person A is trying to say, well, this is what it is like for me inside my mind. Uh, and so they put it into words which go into person B. However, person B can either be saying, well, now I've got to try to really understand this or uh person b can be preparing their next statements um, that are consistent with the way person b thinks about things and not hear with as much understanding what person a has to say i think that can happen to anybody okay so what just happened with regards to your analysis of the way I was and what was happening to me, I think in and of itself highlights a significant limitation in your belief system. And I'm gonna, I had planned on addressing these things differently, but let me just start here. I think your belief system uh, and having a belief system that Make certain makes the kind of assumptions that that I that I hear you make have the kind of axioms that you have leads you, in my opinion, and would lead people to think that they have an understanding of things that they really don't. And one of the thing, and and one of the things I think that you believe you have an understanding of is what happens to me when you speak to me and the things that I can do and can't do with regards to um, my ability, in this case, I think my ability to, to listen to you and understand your ideas and how it affects you while at the same time I'm writing things down. That's, so that's, just, that's just one, I think, concrete example right now that's relevant, but to go I, back. I recognize that I could be incorrect about that uh, so, I, I'm just saying that, that that's the impression that I get, which can be incorrect. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that with regards to me being sympathetic and trying to understand your position, I think you, you may not recall that I had said to you about 10 minutes ago, I completely agree with you that your axioms are very appropriate to adopt um, in certain situations. And, and I agree with you, it is, it is almost, it is not possible to, um, or very, very, it would be very difficult, I think. I haven't really given it much thought, but I think, you know, that it would be difficult to live a life and plan for the future and all the things that we do and not have your axioms, okay? But that, uh, uh, what I think what you, kind of glossed over in what I was saying. And I can understand why, because I brought in that whole, I made the analogy to Newtonian and Einsteinian physics, which I shouldn't have done. I put it on a terrible tangent, but to get back, you kind of glossed over the idea that I said, well, axioms are relevant to certain situations and not relevant to others. And in certain situations, the axioms that you're using are extremely, are very, very appropriate. But in other situations, they're not. And we have to adopt a different set of axioms or eliminate the axioms when we're trying to understand and trying to explain different things. Okay, do you have an example of where uh, my axiom, and I don't know, you're making yes. this plural, uh, but my axiom is that, uh, that there is a, I am only one part 
of a total world and that I have only, uh, uh, I have knowledge and perception and so forth only of a certain part of that total world. Right. So uh, there's, to make it, um, I guess, more succinct, um, you're, you're taking it as axiomatic that the existence of something is independent of your, uh, for lack of a better word, your current thinking, what you're, what you're aware of and thinking about. It, you, you're, you're giving it, that's an axiom. It's axiomatic that there is existence outside of what you think of. Okay, so in that situation, it's, it's inappropriate to have that axiom if you are trying to examine the question of whether existence has any meaning outside of what you're thinking about. So if you're trying to examine that question and trying to gain knowledge in that area, having that axiom you have interferes with that. Okay, so but, that's one example. Okay, but uh, <clears throat> what we came up with was that, okay, I have that uh, axiomatic model, that uh, axiomatic belief uh, that I am not alone in the world, or however you would want to uh, put it. And when we tried to find out what your axiom was, um, that you were saying was better than mine. Uh, no, I no, I'm not saying it's better than yours. Well, what uh, what it's, are it, in in a certain situation? It's in a, I'm claiming it's inappropriate to use that axiom. Okay, in what situation? When we are trying, when you're in a conversation with somebody, and you're trying to um, examine the possibility that existent, the definition of existent depends upon what you're thinking about in a given moment, it's inappropriate to have that axiom because you can't truly, you can't, cons it, it, because that axiom in, in a sense assumes the answer to the questions you're trying to answer. Well, um, that's an example. Well, what, what, uh, what I am not able to see is where you think that um yeah I, okay uh you're you're raising the question that the axiom should not be questioned if the question under consideration is the questioning of the axiom. I think I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying the axiom should be questioned. In fact, yeah. the axiom should, oh, I didn't hear you say that, right. The axiom should be questioned. The axiom should, be, in fact, should no longer be an axiom. If, if you, Basically, what we're doing, in a sense, is examining the veracity of the axiom. So you, you in such a case, you can't, you can't, assume the axiom and continue to use it as an axiom if you're examining the axiom's veracity. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I understand. But um, uh, you are, uh, I assume, saying that, that that axiom is not a good one, that it is not the best. And that you have a better idea. No, no. Presented what the better idea is. Well, what are what is your contention about that axiom of mine? I think that that axiom is a, is appropriate to use in certain situations, and in certain... inappropriate to use in other situations. Well, or maybe I should maybe you could say uh, yeah. Well, no, I'd say inappropriate to use. Probably it may be too strong of a word. Inappropriate, but. Yeah, but in, in certain situations, it makes it sound like, well, you got 150 here and uh, 37 there or something like that. Uh, the only assumption, the only 
circumstance under which I hear you saying that the axiom is inappropriate is when that axiom itself is being questioned. Uh, not necessarily. I, I there are there could be there are implications to what some people would consider um, their spiritual belief systems that would be would would be appropriate not to use the axioms you're talking about. They would be appropriate not to use those axioms when you're claiming something is true, can you and give, you're in. Can you give me an example because I can't imagine one. Which what, what, it for the for spiritual basis. Yes. There, there are a lot of ideas in, in uh, Eastern yogic traditions and Hinduism, this idea of, of uh, a Maya Shakti, where um, you could think of Maya Shakti as, a, as the curtain. And in, 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 our, in our kind of um, analogy, we talk about this as curtain, as something behind the curtain. Well. In, in, in Eastern philosophy, it's called Maya Shukti. I think I'm pronouncing it right. It's a veil that's put over all people that they, they, it is impossible for them to see past. And um, that- Did they see the, the veil? The veil, yeah, that's the curtain. You can't see past the curtain. It's impossible. Do you see the veil? Uh, no. Uh, the, the, what, what the veil creates, so Maya Shakti is kind of placed over you. It's, it's a curtain that's placed over you. And what's inside of the curtain is called Maya. It's the world of illusion. And, they, and the claim is that what's actually behind the veil, what's behind Maya Shakti, is what we would consider to be reality with a capital R. And you kind of can't know it. So if if you okay. are that's so that's the same as my uh, as my model. It's different words. No, 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 no. But but I, I haven't finished with with the kind of kind of implications. <laughs> um, when you go into the specific ide ideas in the Eastern philosophy with regards to delusion. And what's causing the delusion? Um, it it is uh, to, put, to make a, a long story short, because I can't go into all the, the the ideas. We just don't have time. Is that your mind? And I'm, I'm going to use the word that they use. So I don't want to. I can't get into what does mind mean and all that kind of stuff. But your mind is broken, and your mind creates this illusion that is the way Maya works. And if you fix the way your mind works, you, f you, you don't experience, uh, you don't create and experience the world the same way. So in essence, it basically says that um, reality is the way your mind works. And then if you fix quote unquote your mind through these different yogic practices, the the world around you, Maya, kind of starts to, to um, dissolve and eventually Maya Shakti, that veil that's over you disappears. So the, the thing that's different in Eastern philosophy than either of our philosophy is the idea that you can in fact through a lot of hard work and a lot of weird practices, can see through the veil. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, that's like no one's ever been able to do that <laughs> in like 10,000 years. So who okay. knows? But, that but is, that's one example of the spiritual that, benefit. But that is not contradictory to my basic uh, thing. In other words, uh, what you just were talking about was being able to see through the veil and, and see what really existed. So no, 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 no. You missed a certain, you missed an important point. You missed something. I, 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 I said that when you fix your mind, mm -hmm. the world around you changes. So your mind, in in essence, uh, makes 
the world around you. And it's not the world that's broken, it's your mind that's broken. Well, so that's, there's a, there's an important implication there. See, we get uh, we get more terms than like broken, and what does that mean? But what you're describing now, just a, um, a little earlier, you were saying that well, when you fix your broken mind, then you get to see reality as it really is. Now you're saying uh, when you fix your broken mind, you change. Well, because reality. what well, because what happens is you you realize that your mind creates Maya Shakti. So in, in Eastern philosophy, that curtain that we can't see past is created by your mind. That's the that's the a big difference between what you and I, I think maybe would believe. I'm not so sure about it. So you what you eventually see is Maya Shakti is an illusion, and Maya is an illusion. And if these are all just things that were created by a quote unquote broken mind. So the idea in Eastern philosophy that your mind basically is the creator of reality um, is certainly synonymous with a solipsistic point of view. It doesn't require solipsism to believe in it. Just you ask me kind of what does, solip what does my belief system kind of support? But another, another way where there, I think it would be- There was a switch in the use of the word reality um, and talk about creating reality. I think that that is an oxymoron. Well, you know, that's the Eastern, uh, reality would be maybe the wrong word. Um, our subjective experience maybe is a, would be a better analogy that well, our mind creates our subjective experience. And as it as it changes, you know, our subjective experience changes. But so that's just a spiritual example. Another example is when. Well, wait. Let's let's clarify that that example that you just gave collapsed as far as it having meaning for me. It did not seem to be. It seemed like you switched meanings of words uh, in the presentation of it, uh, and that. Um, uh, and that that was not an example. And so I, if, if we're giving examples of something, this would not be an example of it. All right, then let, me, let me be, let me, I, just, let, me, let me try it again. Okay. If, you are, if you are of the opinion that uh, there is a reality out there that's real in the way that you're that that you are assuming it is, it is concrete, it is definite, it is not subject to uh, the existence of it, and the nature of it is innate and independent of what anyone thinks about it, okay, then that is going to clash with what you're reading in Eastern texts, because in Eastern texts, the the idea is that, um, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to go through my presentation again, that there is a veil that's over you called Maya Shakti. And inside that veil, they call Maya, which is your subjective experience. And everything inside your subjective experience, including Maya Shakti itself, is a product of your dysfunctional mind. And the conclusion there is that uh, your mind is creating what you would consider to be reality, not this, this concrete independent thing that's out there that's independent of what you uh, believe in. So that's, that's how, if that's one way having a, a, a belief system that I have is, is synonymous is would, would be synonymous with Western. But well, let me take an easier one. Let me take Western philosophy. Let's take the belief in God. But again, it's sounding like you were saying, let's now that I've demonstrated this to be true, now let's move on to the next thing. But I don't believe that you've demonstrated uh, okay. uh and and again maybe uh, it has to can I finish what I was gonna say? Yeah, go ahead. It's getting it's getting a little late, but 
I, I can say till 4.30, continue. Okay. Um, um, again, as you're presenting this Eastern way of thought, um, the uh, idea uh, that you're pre that is fundamental within it is that uh, your mind is not doing something correctly, that it is broken, that it is uh, that its idea of what is real is not actually so. <laughs> um, and that if one gets through the veil, one can see what is actually so. Okay, well, now that is not inconsistent to a certain extent with my model. The mind is just a model of that which is reality. It therefore you can you could call it instead of a model, you could call it an illusion. Uh, and um, uh, but uh, uh, I would maintain that it would be uh, acts. It's really axiomatic in uh, for me that there isn't a way of changing that such that now one uh, is able to know reality as it is, not just a model of it. Well, in your model, does the mind create the curtain? No. That's the huge difference. Uh, yeah, that, that is a, a good point. Yeah, I, uh, I would not agree the, the concept of the mind being broken uh, implies that at one time it wasn't, and then something happened and it got cracked or whatever. Well, uh, no, and, I think what they mean, they don't mean that. They, they mean uh, that. So but, I was in the middle of trying to say something. When you characterize something and your understanding is wrong, you don't want me to. You don't want me to correct you, because you don't know anything about Eastern philosophy. That's or very little about it compared to me. So that's why. Would you rather me not do that? I thought you would want me to do that. Uh, no, I don't mind. Uh, I'm just saying that when when I'm, in, in, uh, you go on at significant length, and I do not interrupt, um, or very little. But so you it, want me to correct you in hindsight, okay. Right, you know, it, it's like in the middle, when I put in a comma, then you start talking and it pulls it away from what I was wanting to put in after the comma. That's, uh, um, uh, that's characteristic of our communication style together. And it's, uh, and it's partly that I talk so slowly and I understand that. I apologize. Uh, that, that's no excuse for me to interrupt you. Please, I'm, I'm curious to, I'm excited to know what you, continuing your thoughts. I'll write down the, the, the things that I want to uh, make clear to you that you're not understanding about Eastern philosophy. Okay, well, because I've lost my train, go ahead and tell me that. What is that I'm not understanding? Um, I think you would, you'd, well, let me just go back and said this idea that the, I think we could kind of continue. Right? We started this whole thing by saying, the main difference is, is this idea I asked you, you know, in your model, does your mind create the curtain? And you had said no, and you had disagreed with this whole idea of the mind being broken, implying that at one time it wasn't broken and now it is. It's not what they mean. Okay. Another way of, you know, sort of made, I, I'm doing the 30 second elevator explanation of something that's in like 5,000 pages <laughs> written over thousands of years. So maybe broken, that's the word I would use. 
broken in the sense that um not in the sense that it was broken it, it was working at one time and now it's broken but broken in the sense that it causes pain and suffering for a person and it doesn't have to in that way it's broken so it could be it could work in a way that doesn't cause pain and suffering okay well that's a strange meaning of broken but um um, but uh, okay, I understand that. So, um, uh, and that was not the main part of my uh, uh, statement. That was just something I was noting. The um, uh, that is kind of a uh, an offshoot idea. Um, um, <laughs> It has its equivalence, maybe, in the concept of original sin or something like that. Uh, that we are we are uh, sinful by nature and so forth. Oh, interesting. I could see that. Yeah, and I and I think there's there's a whole area I can um, talk about there. But uh, anyway, getting getting back. Um, um, so what I hear you say is that the mind um, engages in an activity, namely the uh, creation of the veil that prevents seeing reality as it is. Does that sound right? Uh, the I word activity, um... I don't know if I'd call it an activity. I think what they mean is more the way the mind we get we're gonna get really into poetry now, Bill. So prepare yourself. <laughs> um, I think I know. I think what they what they mean by that is more the way the mind is structured, the way it's built, the way it is the equivalent would be the way a body would work if you never exercise it, if you never feed it good food, it's gonna be prone to sickness. In the same way, the mind, if you don't do certain exercises and do certain, act, do certain activities, it is gonna be prone to thinking a certain way that causes pain and suffering. So it's more like an innate characteristic of the way the mind is structured that causes the pain and suffering not any activity necessarily that it does yeah well see i um i guess one of the the main areas that i would disagree with would be that it would be possible uh to dispel the veil and to quote see reality as it really is uh, I say that all that we ever have uh, are our models created out of our uh, the contents of our subjective experience that we say reality is like. Okay. And, uh, right. To predict. You see, this is an area I know a little bit even more about. Okay. So, and you've kind of the. The, the basis of the mind's dysfunction, the way that it's broken, according to, and this is just one way it's broken. They're very complicated ways, but one of the main areas that I understand pretty well is this idea of duality. So apparently the claim is um, uh, when we differentiate ourselves, into subject object. So there's you and then there's me. The way we perceive things as being separate from ourselves, there's, like I said, there's you, there's me, there's the car, there's me, there's the United States of America and me, there's me experiencing these things. So apparently that is a major component of what creates, of the way the mind is broken, the way it incorrectly perceives things that creates this veil. That's called Maya Shakti. So apparently, 
the way things actually are, if you remove the veil, is there is no subject object differentiation. And I know this is now this we're going to go into some serious poetry. So again, prepare yourself. So a, a way of thinking about it would be when I, uh, I, I gather, I've never experienced this, but apparently this is the way it is, according to them. When I am speaking to you now and I am relating to you, I right now, because my mind is broken, I'm experiencing you as an independent entity from me. You are separate from me. I am interacting with you. So apparently that's an illusion. And actually we are the same thing. You know, it's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> I think that this um, uh, idea of achieving quote, non-duality may be um, very uh, similar to what's going on within uh, Christianity and actually elsewhere also. Um, but um, uh, what is happening within Christianity uh, is that um, increasingly people are becoming unable to be theistic, to really believe that there is an entity uh, up above watching and uh, changing things for one's self, depending upon its mood toward us, depending upon what we did, et cetera, et cetera. That's becoming uh, increasingly um, non-believable. And yet there is this, there's a lot of good within Christianity. And there are efforts on the part of um, Christianity to, uh, to uh, save um, something about it, the good about it, and to, uh, to be able to um, uh, say that, well, uh, it's still correct. It's just that we have, <laughs> the, the words mean something different. So then uh, what that means is that, uh, well, there's no God in a theistic sense, but there is, uh, there is a God which we can still uh, attempt to achieve, and that God is in all of us and is the, quote, ground of being, you know, whatever that means. Perennial philosophy. So uh, the <laughs> ground of being, um, uh, being uh, something where one, uh, the basic idea is that one has, is able to achieve a connectedness, not, a feeling of not being alone, even though we're not talking about an entity in the clouds that uh, uh, behaves in human ways and so on. And uh, so uh, there's this, I think, basically, basic recognition uh, of our wanting to feel uh, what many people refer to as a, as a meaning to existence, although that's very uh, troubling um, kind of uh, concept. Um, um, I mean, complex, uh, but that, that it involves that one is not alone, that one, uh, and, and I think that it is uh, related to the um, an experience that we've all had, which uh, has been which has been just a very fundamental uh, experience um, that we try in some way to get back to, and that experience is. After we were born, uh, there is this 
unity that we episodically experience with the other who takes care of us and makes us feel good and satisfies our needs and and so forth and that um, uh, that uh, where we feel well cared for if we're lucky and are not in a maternal deprivation uh, situation uh, and that um, uh, as as time goes on then this garden of eden uh, begins to change because we get legs and we can start doing stuff that uh, this entity does not want us to do and this entity actually uh, becomes two in many cases like a mother and a father and even uh, uh, older siblings and so forth uh, but but that um, we had this initial experience uh, that we could not really wish for more than and that is of being totally taken care of nursed uh, 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 and, you know loved uh, with all the meanings of that word and so on mm -hmm. so um so i think that um um that that uh, is one of the things that is being manifested in what you're talking about. about yeah, I mean, religions. I, I, yeah, I, I think it, for, for me, it would be difficult. It, it's difficult for me to claim the, the, the motivation to seek and to view things as, you know, we are all one and to remove this idea of dualism has to do with this, this state that happened to we were an infant because it is so impossible for anybody to remember that state. I mean, it, even me trying to think about it now, I think most people, it's like, it, it's like saying pigs fly. What are you, what are you talking about? I, it just makes no sense. So it's hard to, for me to understand that being a motivation of it. But I will say this, I do know that you know, when, when they talk about non-dualism, you know, there, there's a saying, I think it's in Buddhism. I think it's before enlightenment, chop wood, fetch water. After enlightenment, chop wood, fetch water. So I, I think the idea when they talk about non-dualism, at least in my, in my opinion, you know, I, to your point, I, you, I, you couldn't function that way. I mean, how the heck am I going to relate to anybody with a thinking that like, you know, I'm you and I'm talking to myself. That, that just doesn't seem to be. So I think what they mean by this idea of becoming non-dualistic is you can maintain, you can function within the illusion of dualism while also experiencing the person, I know it's gonna sound like poetry, that you're separate from as also being part of you, maybe. It's hard for me to believe that they really mean that, you know, you're going to become, quote unquote, enlightened, non-dualistic and, you know, uh, not not see yourself as separate from anybody or anything. I mean, I just talked about the idea of non-dualism for me and you. They're also talking about the rocks, the car, the air, the sun, you know, um, a good way that I, an analogy that I use to understand this philosophy is the idea of a radio. So right now we're in a field of radio waves and there's a stereo that I have in my car, equivalent to quote unquote my body. And that stereo picks up these radio waves and they make sound. And that would be the, in the instance of a person. So from a certain point of view, we're all this, well, it's all the same thing. They're all radio waves. And this machine known as our body would be in the analogy is taking those radio waves and, and creating this, this, this localized point of sound, which appears separate in each car that might be playing the radio and they all sound separate, but in reality, it's, it's all radio waves. You know, maybe. That's the best I can, un make, I can understand of it. Well, and that is, uh, I think, 
uh, an area that um, the, uh, that that is important for us. I think that there are two ways that we uh, use our language uh, capabilities. And one is poetic and the other technical. And uh, the poetic, uh, the problem is it uh, makes uh, use of metaphor to a great extent. And uh, it, that's subject to how the person listening to it is interpreting it, which means it can activate all sorts of different things in different minds, so to speak. Yeah, correct. Whereas the technical uh, means uh, that there is an effort to be as precise as possible with the words that are used so that there is not room for making mistakes or for uh, having two different opinions that actually sound the same as far as how they're expressed in words. Yeah. In one. So, well, I agree. I and mean, I, I think the answer to that, that a, that a yogi would, would say is that the best we can do is use analogies and then any kind of technical examination of this phenomenon that I'm attempting to describe is not possible because the the because the because the person that's trying to have the technical convert the tech the, the person that's trying to view this technically is trying to analyze it with a mind that is stuck in this quote unquote broken way of thinking. There's a scene, have you ever seen the movie A Beautiful Mind? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, it's about a mathematician that has schizophrenia. There's a scene in the movie and he doesn't realize he has schizophrenia. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. There's a scene in the movie where he's sitting down with like, the psychiatrist and, and he's trying to convince the psychiatrist that he can think his way out of his schizophrenia. And the psychiatrist says, you can't think your way out of this because your mind is what's the problem. Your mind can't fix this, your mind is the problem. So I think the yogi would say the same kind of thing. You can't understand this in any kind of technical way or even through metaphor really, because the mind that's trying to understand this phenomenon is in of itself not working properly. And that you have to go through, you have to go on faith and go through these practices of meditation and yoga and all this kind of stuff in order to have this experience. It's called samadhi. Once you have samadhi, you can know what it's like, but when you're not in samadhi and you're back to a sense of dualism, you still can't explain it yeah, because well, your mind isn't there. Yeah, well, um, a certain percentage of the population has uh, some unusual experience that really feels great and seems like uh, an increased, um, increased understanding and so forth. And some of the psychedelic substances actually uh, foster that, but it is accomplished at times without psychedelic substances. Yes. Uh, so, um. so the, the thing is uh, <clears throat> for, quote, the mind to suddenly see things differently is just demonstrating a different capability that the mind or the brain has. Uh, th this gets into the mind-body problem, of course, Absolutely. and um, gets into um, areas that I don't really feel like I have explored 
that much, but uh, it's it's hard to feel uh, convinced to do so. And that is uh, essentially uh, working on mind alteration, working on um, the um, having of unusual experiences. But, but on the other hand, uh, people are claiming that there is actually scientific evidence for things like um, reincarnation, past life uh, experiences, and so forth. And I wish that that were really subject to uh, very uh, transparent uh, review by uh, the whole scientific community, not just those who are convinced of the truthfulness of, uh, of the claims. That's fascinating. Somebody told you the scientific evidence for reincarnation? Uh, well, um, you know, the, uh, um, the Rhine Institute um, um, and um, various experiments that have been done to indicate things like uh, um, um, the uh, transmission of uh, information from one to another, even though well, there's no physical way of doing that, and, uh, and uh, out-of-body experiences, and, uh, uh, you know, they've tried things with out-of-body experience, like having a, uh, some uh, shelves with stuff on them to see if a person really can see up above and see the things, but I, I don't, it seems like if one of those experiments was actually so, I mean, actually successful in demonstrating what it is supposed to be looking for, uh, that it would be, um, would make the news, but <laughs> the news is such a cloudy area anyway, so. Yeah, you know, I think the news, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think, you know, the news is also going to reflect any kind of strong biases the population has. Wouldn't it be reported? You know, I'm familiar with those experiments and the medical experiments where they, uh, you know, those are, there's a couple of things that are very difficult for me to explain. One yeah. of, one is those experiments. And I'll just, look, I don't believe these people have any kind of motivation to, to make, to make stuff up you know if no. the person was in surgery and they say they saw x and that the doctor really x was really there yeah i mean that's weird i think what's also strange is is the um the 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 similarity although this has some explanation the similarity of near-death experiences is kind of strange um that's difficult for me to kind of explain well, i i could explain that uh in that it would have to do with what parts of the brain are the first to uh go <laughs> yeah that, that, yeah that kind of thing i know but the, but the, the um uh, i don't think the brain is necessarily exact and I, this is actually true i mean the each brain is not exactly created exactly the same there might be a few millimeters a few half inches off in terms of where the processing happens um you know seeing like seeing certain people from your past having certain emotions seeing certain things that that are you know very 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 common um you know i that's kind of uh, I, I don't see, for example, I don't see any, any explanation for an evolutionary adaptation to have that happen. Would that be any kind of consequence for an evolutionary adaptation? That the mind happens to be built in a certain way such that when you pass away, you have these kind of very positive experiences that are not only that they're, they're synonymous with um, death, 
but they are also synonymous with certain uh, yogic states. That's strange. So the I, you know, seeing the light and and feeling one and unified with everything in the love, that's also in that's also experienced apparently by very accomplished yogis in uh, in India, in history, in the books. You know, um, this is all subjective experience, mm. and as a result, as we've talked about before, subjective experiences is. is the subjective model is not the realm of science. It's 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 the it's subjective experience is, is not the realm of, of science. It's it, it's uh, you, you kind of you can't use science to examine these questions very well. Well, I, I I don't think I could agree with that, but probably we're thinking about different things. Uh, what science consists of is rules having to do with the interpretation of, uh, of data. And it's rules that uh, increasingly eliminate, increasingly reduce the uh, likelihood of making a mistake in interpretation. Mm -hmm. but in, in the same way, what I mean by that is the same way as science is, is not the right tool to examine the veracity of the claim that God exists or I believe in God. Mm -hmm. There are two independent um, domains for lack of a better word. Yeah. Science, science is, is good at examining, like we've talked about, you know, the natural sciences, the natural world. The things we're talking about are not considered to be part of the natural sciences. Science has very little to say about it at the end of the day. I well, think. that has that has to do with the stuff in the <laughs> body problem book, right? That is available free on the humanianity.com website. I always right. plug a little bit. Um, uh, the um, um, but no, uh, I I can't agree. Um, that science is not, not relevant, uh, that it, it would not have to do with um, what kinds of beliefs they were. Uh, it would have to do with the use of the rules of logic and the rules of evidence uh, that uh, reduce the likelihood of making mistakes. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, one can uh, really um, move into an area that, um, uh, well, what it has to do with is nothing about the mind is in the natural sciences. People, of course, will, will disagree with this. I have gotten into trouble by uh, saying that we all have supernatural beliefs because we believe in, in the existence of thoughts and feelings and so on, and they're nowhere in the natural sciences. Um, but uh, that, that's a big topic and everything. Uh, well you said that you were going to need to leave at 4.30. Uh, I, I can go till 5. Are you okay going till 5? Yes. Yeah, you know, I think that, um, you know, on this topic, yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that uh, the things we're talking about is in the mind. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's simply, the, it's not, they're not part of the natural sciences. As a result, it's look, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult for the sciences to, you know, lay definitive, I'm using a keyword, definitive claims are the way that are very strong, um, you know, with, with regards to, to these. Um, you know, if there, you, you, what happens during the process of death or what happens after, you know, after you die. I don't think that. Uh, it would be appropriate to uh, 
to use those subject areas, those tools to kind of examine these questions. I don't think humanity has good tools yet. That might be the best tool we have, but it's still not very effective. I think that, I think that it uh, is entirely appropriate and possible, um, but, um, but there's something more, uh, more basic than that. And that's what, what uh, I refer to in the Mind-Body Problem book having to do with the subjective model and the objective model. Uh, and it's that um, the more that we study and uh, relate to each other, what we find and so forth, the more the model of what exists and how it works becomes different from our subjective experience. Uh, so, you know, like to give an example, um, uh, you look at a wall and it seems pretty solid, but uh, according to the latest findings in, in science, it's mostly empty space um, and, um, and so on. So, uh, and it's made up of these particles that uh, are too small to be seen and that aren't really, they don't behave exactly like particles uh, or exactly like waves, uh, but, um, uh, and so on. So that the more you get into it, the, the more it, the models just have to become mathematical models and so on, so. I think it's, I, I think it's very, I'm gonna use the word, the first word that came to mind was dangerous but that's not inappropriate. I think, it's, I think it's very inappropriate to make a claim that because science doesn't support something, that's different than saying that science has disproved it. But to oh. simply say, because science does not support something means that I should uh, use that, that lack of support to influence my thinking that doesn't seem appropriate to me. Well, uh, <clears throat> those are two different things, but I agree with you that uh, the lack of support is not proof of um, uh, anything because it can always turn out that later, um, you know, that uh, indeed there are new discoveries and so forth. Uh, so again, we're, it's, it's the dealing with probabilities, but. Um, uh, and the probabilities, I think, are based on a certain, again, these idea of axioms that simply, you know, what do, in this case, I think these axioms are, you know, what do you consider to be necessary? What's your opinion? What's your preference as to regards the, the necessary degree of proof? to have you believe one way or the, or the other. I well, think, go well, ahead. Sorry. Well, the proof really is something that only exists in the area of logic. And uh, um, when you get into the rules of evidence, the scientific method and everything, then it is an issue of probabilities of how likely or how probable is something. Um, and um, uh, that that can always vary and so forth. So uh, scientists don't prove anything, although sometimes they um, give evidence that uh, something that a model is highly accurate, you know, like uh, quantum physics, uh, uh, apparently, people are impressed with the accuracy um, of the ability to predict, but that's not. That, but proof is not something that is in the sciences. Proof is is my word for convincing. What I meant by proof, I may use the word convinced. You know, what criteria do you want to select that you feel will convince you? Uh -huh. You know, of something. And I've I've heard many many arguments from people who have a lot to say with regards to death or what happens after death. And uh, a lot of people seem to claim that, well, 
you know, it's not supported by science. And the reason why you're believing in X or Y or whatever it is you believe in is simply because you're frightened of death and you want to somehow convince yourself of something. Um, I think that's, yeah, I think that's a very, that's, I, I just think that's a ridiculous argument. Um, I, I think. I think that, that um, um, we know that a person's worldview and their way of looking at life can have so much uh, to do with how they feel uh, such that uh, some ways of looking at things uh, convince the person that it's better just to uh, kill oneself. And then uh, other people uh, are uh, filled with joy by virtue of how they see things and so on. So, uh, but by the way, I think that uh, we have fled from our, uh, our original topic. Well, I was I could bring, I was about to bring it back. Oh, okay. Um, and and this, this you asked we were talking about what are some of the benefits of oh. of my worldview, and um, I think this is another one, which is I, I think that my worldview does not support me having an unrealistic for me to be making claims that I know things, let me make 10 seconds, I'm not gonna use the word no. I think that my belief system does not support my making claims that um, I am aware of things and know certain things. I use the word no again, I can't help it. Um, they have no basis claiming. And this is an example of, of what happens when I die or after I die. Um, I, I would argue the most reasonable, appropriate belief system with regard to what happens after I die is that I have no idea. Now, if you believe, however, if you, you believe in a, 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 a truth that is kind of independent of your own beliefs that, it, that uh, is somehow um, I have to uh, aspire to, I have to get as close to that, that truth as possible. I think that uh, that orientation and that worldview will motivate me to have in this case, to, to take the ideas of science, which really can't support either way, anything that happens after you die or when you die to a certain degree, more after you die um, as being true rather than not being able to say either way. It, it encourages an inappropriate amount of faith in, um, in things, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, um, and I, I don't have uh, any uh, position that I feel strongly about. I personally, uh, have the belief that when I die, that will be it for me. Um, but uh, I know that uh, there are uh, those who believe differently and uh, I'm open to, um, you know, uh, ideas. I'm open to uh, evidence uh, in favor of um, existence past uh, death and so on. I would say that I have not explored that uh, in as much detail uh, as maybe I should, but then I also feel like um, uh, I am not 
really equipped to uh, pass judgment on the uh, the adequacy of the uh, the scientific methods used to uh, um, explore other possibilities. Yeah. See, what troubles what uh, I take exception with maybe in, in what you just said is the idea of, of you said evidence for mm -hmm. something past death. It's the idea of evidence. And this is where I think we get to the limitations of the scientific method or, uh, let's stop there, to, 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 to the scientific methods and, and experiments and whatnot. And that if you have a worldview that orients yourself to the idea that there's this um, truth out there that I have to find evidence for in order for me to believe in it, that'll get me closer to that truth. Well, that's appropriate. That belief system worldview is appropriate for a lot of things, but there are certain areas for which you can't get evidence for that basically means that it is extremely difficult while maintaining that worldview for you to answer those kinds of questions and gain um, um, a better understanding, a greater accuracy with regards to those questions. Um, there might be one day uh, a way of thinking that is yet to be invented, like the scientific method in a sense was invented. Maybe one day we'll figure out a way of, of, of answering these kinds of questions. But right now, that's why I, I, I think the, the most uh, accurate claim with regards to uh, death, or, or, or this idea of axioms is that certain axioms and certain belief systems are appropriate to have when you're trying to understand certain ideas, but they're very inappropriate when you're trying to understand others. And this idea of what happens after you die, um, that requires a different set of axioms to understand than the idea of you know me going home to my wife and does she exist or not? My everyday living. That's my claim. So I think it does support this idea of you have to have different axioms to answer different questions. Well, yes, I certainly would not disagree with that, except unless we're talking about really fundamental axioms that are uh, like, like, for instance, mine, that there is such a thing as reality and that all we have are models of it, um, uh, and so on. Um, the uh, the problem, one of the problems um, uh, that we are faced with is we can believe just about anything, and what we have seen is that an enormous amount of pain, suffering, disability, and early death uh, is caused by our believing certain things that many others would say there was no reason to believe. You know, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think. I think accuracy of belief is important. I think you're taking you take an additional step here that I wanted that I feel like you make you aware of. It's, it's not just belief. Yes, people can believe anything they want. It's the pain, suffering, and all the problems come into when they start saying, my idea is right, my belief is right, yours are wrong. I believe something that's right, you believe in something that's wrong. It's not this really, I claim, it's not belief per se. You can believe that all Jews are vermin and should be burned in concentration camps. You can believe that. It's not going to cause pain, suffering, disability, and early death. What's going to do that is if you then say, well, okay, I'm right. I know what's best for everybody else. I'm going to now exercise this and rid people of the world of, of, this, of this vermin. So it's We're, belief. I would. I think you should make a delineation between belief here. Between belief and what? Between belief and 
and action. That's off the top of my head. Okay. Now, in my first book, it talks about determinants of behavior and our beliefs and motivational states are our main determinants of behavior. And right. so what we believe, uh, uh, including our ethical beliefs about what we should and should not do uh, and so forth, um, uh, uh, determine to a great extent what we actually do. Mm -hmm. But it's a complex uh, system of beliefs and motivational states that produces any kind of activity. Um, right. Now, so my claim, and I've, I've made this before in our conversations. So my claim that a belief system that posits uh, truth is, some, is an ideal that one needs to inspire themselves to, that one can be accurate or inaccurate against, I believe, uh, is a belief system and a worldview that motivates people to have action much faster and much more dramatically than a belief system that uh, doesn't have an idea that there is an, a truth out there that you can be accurate or inaccurate against. That instead, um, truth is um, individualized for each person. So I think there are two very, very different, they, they both, both belief systems encourage the idea of being encouraged, not necessitate, but they encourage a very different set of, of, of behaviors. Yes, well, I, I think that I don't um, agree with some of that. Um, I, I know you're talking about the postmodern view and that, uh, that, that the postmodern well, view, I agree, is an effort to avoid conflict well what's true for me may not be true for you there's no absolute truth there's no uh so it's just uh if it works for you then that's fine it works for you so we'll just have a beer you know, and, um, whether or not it's postmodern, I, I think that we had decided a couple of conversations back that our our belief systems are such that you know to, to claim that you're an empiricist or a solipsist or I'm a postmodernist or whichever, it's kind of inappropriate because it kind of goes into you know, what do those belief systems actually mean? And so we were going to start saying, you know, my belief system and your belief system. So, you know, I do think that your belief system uh, encourages uh, and motivates people to proceed towards action because they can be right in some kind of absolute sense. Whereas my belief system um, has encourages that to a much lesser degree because it is much more difficult to, for a person to claim, you know, I'm right, absolutely, and you're wrong, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I don't agree with your portrayal of my uh, belief system and hmm. uh, the um, humanianity uh, concept. Um, uh, so, uh, but that gets into, uh, a complex area. Um, okay. Uh, want to save that for next time? Uh, well, we can do that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's just uh, open it quickly. I'm sorry. You want to open it quickly? So we have some basis to talk about next time, maybe just for another five minutes. I don't think that that would be doing Save a good it. job. No. Okay. Okay. And also, I'm a little bit worried. I think we have fled from the solipsism uh, issue that that we're still in disagreement. Yeah, uh, I really um, liked the idea of us not characterizing and pigeonholing our belief systems to a certain idea. So, you know, I, you know, you're not an empiricist, I'm not a solipsist. It's more my belief system and your belief system because it's quite nuanced and kind of, kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, can you say what you just said again without solipsism so I can better understand it? 
You mean uh, that we still, I think, have some uh, basic areas of disagreement uh, and uh, that one of the key things has to do with um, the uh, issue of um, axiom or, uh, or assumption. Remember that I was able to give you my axiomatic position, but you had difficulty giving me yours. And then we're saying that, well, maybe uh, one shouldn't have. I think I'm not sure exactly what you're saying. Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. So I think, yeah. Um... The way I would just one of the ways I would describe it is you and I think very much the same. Mm -hmm. We have different axioms we're using. And the axioms we're using is reflective of preferences we have. Just opinions and preferences we have to what uh, are appropriate axioms and which are not. So I think that, yeah, I think that the next step would be for us to examine um, what our axioms are, if we're using axioms. If I claim it's not appropriate to use an axiom, I have to kind of defend that position. Here's why it's not appropriate. If you're using an axiom, here's, you can defend why it is appropriate. And I think that, that's an area where we could focus in on next time, at this idea of axioms that we're using. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Very good. I, I don't feel like I was that good on the conversation uh, part today. I was more passionate than I, I like to be. So I, I apologize for interrupting you and I appreciate you letting me know. Oh, what well. Do better next time. Passion is understandable and not necessarily a bad thing. So, well, well no, it motivates I... interruption. It's a bad thing. Yeah. Well, I think any two people having a discussion. Uh, they have to kind of every now and then work on the um, the procedures within the the discussion um, to make sure that it's more balanced or in the direction it should be. Yes. So, so I don't see any problem with that. Very good. All right, my friend. I appreciate it. Okay. So take I'll care. take care. I'll see you. Stay healthy. I'll see you next week. Right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Human Now we all can see Human Now we all can see How much better we